Okay. <clears throat> thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. And for your understanding. So, the title today is How Does Polyvagal Theory Enable Us to Understand Auditory Processing? So, our nervous system is essential to our well being, just like air and water. It's an invisible superhighway that links all functions in our body. Its functioning is fundamental to how we feel, how we maintain our energy levels, how we show up and perform in life. The problem so many of us are facing today is that our current lifestyle presents continuous and unrelenting stress demands with our nervous, which our nervous system was not designed to accommodate. Our body gets stuck in the on fight or flight position. We don't know how to release the tension and come down from the adrenaline surge. And unfortunately, this is affecting our children as well. In our evolution, threatening situations were short-lived. Our fight or flight mechanism kicked in if we were being chased by a lion and afterwards we went back to a state of peace so we could rest and regenerate. But in today's world, we have continual deadlines to meet, bills to pay, traffic to negotiate, corporate ladders to climb. So many of us develop the habit of staying in a switched on stress response state continually. And after some years of this behavior, our adrenals wear out. We are then in a state of adrenal fatigue or burnout in which the health of our whole body is affected. Chronic stress and burnout has been linked to digestive issues, skin problems, high blood pressure, sleep disorders, and autoimmune diseases. However, it has been shown that if a stress condition is treated, it reduces the likelihood that a more serious autoimmune disease will develop. Now, many of the symptoms I've just mentioned are showing up in children and also affecting their ability to concentrate and learn. Treatment is commonly done with antidepressants or for children with dexamphetamine, Ritalin and the like. But an option for those who choose a holistic health approach that is more comprehensive and without negative side effects is to use retraining techniques. These include biofeedback and various conscious methods of brain retraining and calming exercises. So let's do an exercise now. I'm gonna take you through a process to see if we can embody what I'm talking about. So I want you to think of a time in your life when you felt scared and remember that occasion. Now, I don't wanna send anyone to trauma. So if you've had a really deeply traumatizing event, don't choose that. But think of something where you were scared, but that's not gonna trigger you into shock. I'll, I'll share mine with you just to give you an idea. Mine was a scuba diving accident and I was diving across this little bay with my buddy underwater, going along following the compass and then suddenly uh, the water got shallower, suddenly we're in the breakers, these waves are buffeting us and we have no control, we can't go down, um, we can't get out, there's just waves hitting us and I was really panicking, I was holding my regulator in, I was breathing heavily and thinking this is a scuba diving emergency. And I didn't know how we were going to get out. And then what happened, suddenly the waves lifted us onto the rocks and we were able to climb out. It wasn't a problem, but it was really scary at the time and my heart was racing. So think of the scary event in your life, if you can think of one, and just really remember that event. Put yourself back there. So what was your body doing? What was your heart rate doing? Your breathing. <clears throat> your thinking. What were you thinking? So... You were in fight or flight. The sympathetic nervous system was going to town. Now, if you had been in that state, let me ask you, would you have been able to take in information and learn new things? Say if you were sitting in a classroom feeling like that. I don't think so. So now think of a time when you were scared or feeling shame or some other emotion that you couldn't deal with and you went into shutdown. For me, this used to happen when I had maths lessons and I couldn't understand. I just went into brain freeze. And for you, it might have been a trigger in school or maybe an emotional situation where you felt bad or bereft or humiliated, something that made you shut down. So I want you to remember, how did your body feel? How was your breathing? How was your mind? Were you in a state where learning was easy? No, 
I don't think so. You were in a freeze state. Neurons weren't going to be firing too well in that state. This is the state of hibernation, shock, disengagement. You weren't really able to connect with what was going on around you. So now think of a time when you were connected, just relaxed, having a good time with people who cared about you, letting your hair down, being yourself, maybe with family or good friends or great colleagues. So how did your body feel? How was your heart? How was your breathing, your mind? Do you think you would be able to take in new information in that state? Well, probably yes. So this is a best state for learning. Now, most of us find that state hard to access and children do too. They may be chronically stressed and therefore disengage. So the question is, how is it that we are so locked into our stress patterns? And where is stress stored? And what are the approaches to recovery? Now, the tendency to store stress in the body is operating at the unconscious level of the brainstem, but it can be controlled by the higher brain centers if we learn how. This work is a particular interest in dealing with trauma. Trauma is sensations left in the body, which we keep revisiting or replaying after an event in the past, which was threatening to our safety. Various techniques have been tried to unravel and release these traumatic replay patterns. One is mindfulness or meditation, but this can be re-traumatizing as it creates a lot of stillness and openness in which the traumatic feelings may be reactivated and actually become more dominant. <clears throat> what is necessary to change the body's habitual response and stop this replaying of the traumatic sensations is a retraining process to learn self-regulation. This can be done with neurofeedback or various somatosensory or emotional release methods. Another technique which can support such change in a very easy to apply and non-threatening way is sound therapy using beautiful music that is filtered to provide a very precise re-education of neural pathways. It remaps patterns within the nervous system and rebuilds and strengthens self-regulation skills, reinforcing the dominance of the newest social engagement branch of the vagal nervous system. Now, the encouraging reality is that you have the capacity to heal yourself if you can get the right stimulation into your nervous system. What you need is to learn at a very subtle level a new set of behavior responses to replace the old reactive programming that was put in place years ago and is no longer serving you. Recovery is about learning to become a better listener to the lower brain and its auto autonomic, automatic reactions so that we can process and release stress after the event. And in this way, it doesn't get stored and built up in your system and become toxic and debilitating. But this type of retraining is difficult. It requires time and dedication to learn to recondition your nervous system using these conscious training techniques. It requires hours of study supported by qualified coaching and it can be costly. So this is where we see the benefit of using a technique like sound therapy which is a passive process requiring minimal effort or time and which can reinforce and facilitate the success of such conscious training methods. Sound therapy as developed by the ear specialist, Dr. Alfred Tomatis, uses filtered and activated music to recondition the auditory pathways. Research by Stephen Porges, the developer of the polyvagal theory and numerous others, has proven that sound therapy can significantly enhance our ability to switch our nervous system into the calming and beneficial social engagement pathways, which is possible only when our autonomic stress levels have been switched off in favour of the newer, myelinated social engagement branch of the vagus nerve. Available in its portable form, sound therapy has the great advantages of being pleasant, easy, unobtrusive, and requiring no additional time to be set aside. It can be done in concert with daily activities by adults or children, or in combination with retraining and neural regeneration activities, such as the ones used in equipping minds. It is common for children recovering from learning disabilities and other stress-related conditions to benefit 
from remedial learning programs temporarily, but they may regress if the fundamental neural processing hasn't been addressed. Sound therapy has the advantage that it can be used at any time, both during study or when relaxing. So it provides continuous support in a way that's very easy for families to manage. For some decades, we've been aware of two different systems within the autonomic nervous system. These are the sympathetic, known for its mobilization and fight or flight reaction, which is shown on the right there, the green side, and, the, and then there's the parasympathetic, the older system, which causes an organism to freeze in immobility or rest and digest. Now, the autonomic nervous system has two branches. This is them. Sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. Stephen Porter's in his polyvagal theory has proposed a third system, the social engagement system, which is much newer in evolutionary terms. This system is unique to mammals. You don't find it in reptiles. And it's much more developed in primates and humans. It is fundamental to maternal bonding and all other social relations which step which stem from that primal first connection. So the parasympathetic nervous system has two portions. The, so within, within, I showed you the, the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. One of those is the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system then has two portions as well the ventral vagal portion, which is engagement, and the dorsal vagal portion, which is freeze. So both of these are under the parasympathetic nervous system. Great interest has been activated in the therapeutic community by the new understanding of our vagal systems, as you know and you've been talking about at your conference. And recent studies reveal its key role in inflammation, mood and pain regulation, as well as the ability to engage with others and develop language skills. Now, knowledge of the role of the vagal nerve goes back as far as Darwin, who said, the heart, guts, and brain communicate intimately via a nerve, the pneumogastric nerve or vagus, the critical nerve in the expression and management of emotions in both humans and animals. When the mind is strongly activated, it instantly affects the state of the viscera. So the ventral vagal portion gives us our social engagement response. The dorsal portion gives us our freeze response. But we're dealing with a spectrum of responses, from less evolved to most evolved. So we see that spectrum here. The primitive mammalian response in the parasympathetic nervous system is on the left, hibernation, shock, disengagement, in immobility, blood goes to the core, low oxygen, low metabolism. Then in the center, we see the fight or flight, which is the, the um, SNS, activity, exercise, adrenaline. And on the right, the social engagement connection, which gradually slows the heart rate. If this system, with these three different branches, is not well regulated, it does the wrong things at the wrong times. And then we have chaos. Get stuck in the on position or stuck in the off position. And this is when we get things like burnout. If stress isn't deactivated when it's no longer needed, we end up burning out the adrenals and nothing works well. Various therapeutic methods are being explored to assist people in accessing and turning on the pro-social mammalian system. You could say that we are learning to react like mammals, not reptiles. And this work mm -hmm. is paralleled by Tomatis' discoveries much earlier about our bonding to the mother and later to others through sound. When we are able to operate from the more evolved social engagement system, life is very different. We are calm, present in our own agency, able to respond and engage with others in a warm, compassionate way. We can be and express ourselves in a soft, responsive, alert and confident manner and engage with true empathy. And this applies to children too. What we learned from polyvagal theory is that it provided us with a more sophisticated understanding of the biology of safety and danger, one based on the subtle interplay between the visceral experiences of our own bodies and the voices and faces of the people around us. 
It explained why a kind face or a soothing tone of voice can dramatically alter the way we feel. It clarified why knowing that we are seen and heard by the important people in our lives can make us feel calm and safe and why being ignored or dismissed can precipitate rage reactions or mental collapse. It helped us understand why focused attunement with another person can shift us out of disorganised and fearful states. In short, Porter's theory made us look beyond the effects of fight or flight and put pro-social relationships in front and centre in our understanding of trauma. It also suggested new approaches to healing that focus on strengthening the body's system for regulating arousal. So I know you've talked about this a lot already, so I'm going to speed up just a little bit, but here's another diagram showing the social, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, the three branches of the nervous system. And there's what you will be particularly interested in is that there is a particular physiological link between Porsche's work and the work of Dr. Tomatis, who has developed sound therapy. And this involves the cranial nerves. The vagal nerve works in concert with several other cranial nerves. So the vagal nerve gives us parasympathetic control of the heart, lungs, and digestive tract, it innervates all our internal organs with the exception of the adrenal glands. It also works in concert with the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve addresses sensing facial expression, mouth and tongue, chewing and swallowing. And look how involved this nerve is also. So many pathways going through those different parts of the face. Then we have the facial nerve, which controls facial expression, mainly in the upper face, tear production, saliva, taste, and it regulates the middle ear muscles. Interesting. Then we have the glossopharyngeal nerve, which controls the tongue, sensations, taste, and speech. And all of these are closely interrelated with what's going on in the ear and the auditory pathways. And Dr. Tomatis, the founder of sound therapy, gave us the key for directly bringing about positive change in this system, as well as conscious thought, breathing, and other subtle psychological processes, stimulation of the middle ear muscles has been found to significantly affect our vagal function. Sound therapy was first discovered by Tomatis in the 1950s and what much work was done on our understanding of listening as an active process to assist in learning and vocal production. Tomatis was a pioneer and an innovator who asked questions which took him into uncharted territory. As a result, he discovered a method of stimulating the sensory and neural systems, which was unprecedented and the impact of which is only beginning to be fully understood some six decades later. The fact that he was so far ahead of his time may partly explain why his system, although it received considerable recognition during his lifetime, is not more widespread than it is today. But more recently, research has shown its impact on many conditions, including auditory processing, sound differentiation in noise, anxiety and stress response, developmental delay, epilepsy, tinnitus, recovery from stroke, brain damage and neural regeneration. Porter's work has revealed the evolutionary and neurophysiological basis for what has already been demonstrated by Tomatis and how the sound therapy mechanisms work. So it begins with the middle ear muscles. <clears throat> Dr. Tomatis put forward a unique theory that listening to sound therapy chooses music that has been processed and activated using his electronic ear, provides a stimulus which exercises and normalises the middle ear muscle function. This then opens the whole auditory pathway to rehabilitation through sound. The complex harmonies and melodies of this uniquely filtered sound go on to rewire and restore functionality to large portions of the nervous system via the cranial nerves, which have so many linkages to our auditory function. Now this pro program was adapted for portability by my mother, Patricia Jowdry and me. And my role has been the ongoing development and dissemination of the portable, more affordable version of Tomatis treatment. It was first released by my mother in the early 1980s. We've seen similar results with this, much more accessible and convenient delivery method, and have been able to bring it to thousands of families who could not have afforded the treatment in the Tomatis listening labs. Research has been done on the portable method to verify that it gets similar results to the similar 
to Marsha's clinic-based method. A pilot study using our Jowdry portable sound therapy program was undertaken by Warhurst and Kemp at Sydney University. Now, Portis has demonstrated that activating the middle ear muscles tunes us into the voice by dampening low frequency noise and enabling us to focus more on the high frequencies in the human voice. He said, when the birds are singing, we feel safe. Warhurst says in her study, middle ear muscles have sensory endings, which through neural arches originating from the anterior horns of the spinal cord, regulate levels of contraction, establishing biofeedback. Recent findings have thus redefined conceptualizations of middle ear muscle movement, in particular their movement in response to different sound frequencies. So the method used in this study was heart rate variability. This study was done at Sydney University and they used heart rate variability, which is an established measure for good vagal regulation, to test the impact of sound therapy on normally functioning university students. They found that listening to sound therapy, even for a short period of time, significantly increased heart rate variability compared to the control group. And their main findings were that participants who were exposed to sound therapy showed improvement on well-established measures of vagal regulation over and above participants who were exposed to classical music control. So this supports the notion that exposure to sound therapy causes increases in heart rate variability and gives insight into the link between the middle ear muscles, the cranial nerves and the heart. Sound therapy has proven to be an effective tool for helping to improve self-regulation and thus make social engagement more possible. That was the conclusion. To improve our self-regulation and regain a balanced and well-organised nervous system, we need to restore the correct hierarchy in our vagal neural branches. <clears throat> the most recently evolved Social engagement branch of the vagal nerve needs to be the primary operating system so that it is controlling the whole system. It works directly on the autonomic nervous system. It's been proven to enhance the function of the cranial nerves, middle ear muscles, and to promote stress relief and better self-regulation and social engagement. Therefore, it's an important tool to be considered as a support to any system for retraining our nervous system. Now, I recently undertook a research review of studies on auditory processing using tomato based sound therapy. <clears throat> studies have been done in so many countries, 23 countries altogether. And subjective, it, it was interesting, it came out in these studies that subjective observation was as significant as statistics. Some interesting points from the study were some children in Africa and the US felt safer from using sound therapy after being in fear, posture improved, leadership improved, attitudes to learning, responsibility improved, self-esteem. There's a hypothesis that sound therapy stimulates myelination of the nerves, so no wonder. And Tamata said the high frequencies are the most important part of the sound. Music is a powerful healer. Sound therapy actually uses music. Music has been accepted as a powerful healing method since ancient Greece and that was longer, and it's had many advocates over the centuries. But when Tomatis developed his method, he applied gating and frequency filtration combined with right ear emphasis to achieve enhanced integration in not just the auditory pathways, but also many other parts of the nervous system. Now, his unique theory of rehabilitation of the auditory system and the nervous system was based on his knowledge of embryology and his keen observation of many facets of life. The ear is uniquely positioned, so it plays an integrating role in many neuroanatomical systems, including hearing, balance, posture, movement, vision, and the development of language. So in the study, I actually reviewed 100 different studies on tomatoes therapy. This review covered the studies done in a wide variety of fields in 23 countries. Uh, the fields that were reviewed were uh, singing, musicality, the conditions, auditory processing, learning difficulties, dyslexia, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, stroke, communication, reading, academic 
performance, speech problems, including dyspraxia and stuttering, voice, focus and concentration, spatial perception, severe development, mental disability, epilepsy, brain damage, foreign language learning, depression, anxiety and pregnancy. And that study will be available to you very soon in a couple of weeks when we launch our new Sound Therapy Synergy website. So what we're discovering is sound impacts well-being. And I'd like to just talk about the progression from holistic to integrative therapy because it's all about the holism and how it all fits together. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In early Europe, earlier European-style medical thinking leading up to the 1950s, a more holistic approach to the human being was the norm. And Dr. Tomatis' innovative exploration of the deeper psychological impact of sound on their well-being and relationship was acceptable within the general philosophies of this era following Freud's introduction of ideas such as the unconscious and superconscious to our awareness. But in the ensuing decades, and particularly in English-speaking Western countries, scientific reductionism and objective empirical research led to a more fragmented and mechanised approach. In this research environment, the Tomatis method was not a natural fit, as there was a tendency to want to isolate each part of it and find out which one was actually working, rather than acknowledging the possible synergy of all its elements in our whole complex being. This may partly explain why the method has not reached a greater level of mainstream acceptance and recognition. I just realised if I put this screen over here, at least you can see me as well. We see you too. Yeah. You were seeing me anyway, were you? Oh, okay. It's cleverer than I think. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one researcher start also noted that Tomatis' premises did not fit the dominant theories of the day. And being essentially based on neurophysiological and electronic approaches, they were very removed from mainstream educational practice. But fortunately, a new trend is now emerging in neuroscience. As we delve further into the workings of the brain in the late 20th century, and objective measures of brain function, such as EEG, MRI, ABR, MLR, and LLR, these were developed as research tools, they gave us a far more subtle, complex measures of the unseen parts of our functioning, and a new spectrum of complexity and integration of the human system began to emerge. So various neurodevelopmental scientists who had been innovating in their clinical practice were gradually able to find scientific verification for their observations. And some of the pioneers who helped fuel this understanding, who I'm sure you've heard about and been talking about, were Jean Ayers, whose work on sensory integration informed a new generation of occupational therapists and non individual educators, uh, who began to understand our developmental process in which all sensory pathways must develop in an integrated harmony to give us useful perception. And Michael Merzenek and many other neuroscientists who proved the reality of brain plasticity. And then Stephen Porters who developed the polyvagal theory explaining the links between the autonomic nervous system and the emergence of social behaviour. So why music? Well music impacts the whole body and the brain. Music changes mechanical energy into electrochemical energy in the central nervous system. And music releases endorphins and other neurotransmitters affecting behavior, physiology, and emotion. So I want to discuss what are appropriate research methodologies in this field. Because in reviewing a sensory-based holistic method, such as the Tomatis method, we should first acknowledge how such treatments differ from a mainstream medical approach, such as drug treatment or surgery. Sensory treatments such as sound therapy are entering and effective act, affecting our entire complex nervous system by drawing on its own self-organizing and self-correcting healing potential. In contrast, drugs work in spite of or in contradiction to the internal organization of the system. They're compensating for its deficits by fixing a final symptom even if this is detrimental to the body's innate balance and organisation. However, when we attempt to test a program, 
that is entering into and enhancing our internal sensory integration systems. We do not know what outcomes specifically we're looking to measure. Tomatoes-based sound therapy has been observed to produce changes in our nervous system, our auditory system, our muscular system, our emotional system, our language system, our sleep system, our vestibular system, our sensory integration, and all the diverse aspects of our functionality related to that. So when someone undertakes sound therapy, a stimulus is being put into our entire set of living systems, physical, emotional, and mental. And we cannot anticipate what end result will occur from this in the same way that we can predict symptomatic relief from a drug test. For this reason, when researching sound therapy, qualitative research and case histories are often more a more suitable approach than quantitative measures. In every study undertaken, it's clear that certain individuals benefit extensively and experience multifaceted, life-changing results. Many other participants will have mild benefits, which in relatively healthy individuals may be hard to measure or may be outside the parameters being studied and therefore not detected within the research methods. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume that quantitative results will be lower than they should they cannot accommodate the vastly varied and subtle responses of each nervous system. But the sheer body of studies that have been carried out and the continuing interest in tomatoes-based sound therapy across many specialist fields are a clear confirmation of its profound benefits for the human system. Tomatoes distinguish between organic and functional damage, a distinction which has still not been acknowledged by current audiological practice. He believed that when damage is merely functional, it is principally caused by suboptimal functioning of the middle ear muscles. Initially, tomatoes turned the music on and off at short intervals to activate and deactivate the muscles in order to exercise them. He then found a better effect resulted from alternating music through channels emphasizing either bass or treble sounds. He found that through listening to music processed in this way, patients were regaining the ability to perceive frequencies that had been lost. At the same time, there was an immediate and spontaneous improvement in the frequencies within their voice. This is the effect which was tested at the Sorbonne University in Paris and is famously known as the Tomatis effect. My recent research review covered, as I mentioned, 100 studies in 23 countries and 13 different groups of clinical conditions, which I read out before, and included a total of almost 500, 5,000 participants, sorry. So today I'm going to briefly renew a number of the studies on auditory processing disorders. You can see there there were 19 studies on auditory processing. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but uh, I'd like to discuss a few of them. Now, the headings here, what they are talking about is some parameters which pertain to auditory processing, because although auditory processing disorders are generally used in the context of a developmental learning difficulty, auditory processing more generically means the many facets used by every person in applying a language facility in daily life. And this includes receptive language listening, auditory memory, processing of meaning, cognitive perception, and expressive language, the ability to form thoughts into words, to share and express ourselves. Now, adults can also have this disorder, and they will be aware that their language processing hinders their full participation in many areas of life. While sound therapy treats a large array of ear and brain related conditions, in most cases, its core action can be best described as enhancement of auditory processing. Tomata surmise that the development and functioning of the auditory system is intrinsically interlinked with our larger neurophysiological system via the cranial nerves and embryological origins. The auditory system is known to have capability functions which include equilibrium in space, sound perception, attention to and discrimination of sound, localization of sound, and auditory input to the development of coordinated laterality. And children with auditory processing disorders are known to have deficits in several of these abilities involving sound perception, discrimination, and its hierarchical organization. Tomato sound therapy has been found to repair and restore many of these auditory processing skills by stimulating and re-educating the listening function 
a process which relies on this spectrum of capabilities is the, of the auditory system. Tomatis also hypothesized that sound transmits energy via cortical brain recharge. He was unique in his claim that high frequency sound is an essential component of this rehabilitation, enabling the brain to improve its sound processing. Now we know that 80% of the cilia, the hair cells in the cochlea, are responsive to high frequency sounds, above 3000 hertz. Tomato sound therapy retrains the ear to high frequencies up to 10,000 hertz or more. So let's look at some of the actual studies that have been done. I reviewed several studies focusing on auditory processing between 2011 and 2016. And one of them was by Bonthes, who concluded the Tomatis method was shown to compare well with other interventions for the promotion of self-regulation. Qualitative observations showed improved listening in social and academic contexts, attention and awareness, self-control mm -hmm. and interpersonal regulation. This study was published in the Journal of Psychology in South Africa, and it explored the self-regulating and coping skills of university students in response to the challenges presented by their changing and demanding roles, both socially and academic. Uh, there were 26 students and they hypothesized that listening and attention are crucial skills in self-regulation. They tested the impact of the modest treatment on this test group of 26 students against two control groups using interactive qualitative analysis. Next study we have is by Strotska in 2015 at the Institute of Acoustics in Mikowic University in Poland and <coughs> compared Kamat Tomatis treatment to an interactive auditory training program, acoustic training on visually impaired children and teenagers. They measured the performance of 55 subjects on auditory and spatial tasks, which included pitch perception, uh, memory and lateralization. And even in a limited four week period, the results showed that both the Tomatis music treatment group and the acoustic training delivered observable benefits compared to the control groups. The greatest improvement was in lateralization and teenagers improved more than children. Then Young at Chikara Elementary School in the USA measured for impact on 23 students on reading, writing, math, attention, focus, comprehension, auditory processing, classroom attention, and productivity. And results indicate that the treatment provides great potential improvement for students at all learning levels. The principal of the school stated that the children being studied live in daily fear for their lives. They appear to have ADD and live in anxiety for their survival, both in and out of school. She observed that all of the students in the pilot study started to feel safe. She and others observed that leadership skills emerged, grades improved, and you could see the happiness on the children's faces. Quantitative analysis showed that while the median scores of the students were just below national expectations, the rate of growth exceeded national expectations in all three grade years that were examined. The conclusion is that the children receiving tomatoes treatment are catching up at a more rapid rate than the control group. The dark blue bars in this figure represent the tomatoes group. And this is a uh, table showing the quantitative survey results for leadership, responsibility, academic performance, self-esteem, overall behavior, posture, attitude toward learning, communication skills, confidence level, and the percentage of teachers who noticed improvement, which is in most cases greater than 50%. Then we have Dutrois et al. in 2011 at Northwest University Pochestroom in South Africa, undertook a study in which the Tomatis method was extended beyond its more traditional clinical context of auditory processing disorders to explore the specific challenges of auditory processing faced by interpreters. In the wake of apartheid, the integration of colleges in South Africa created an urgent requirement for greater numbers of simultaneous interpreters for students. This study demonstrated mm -hmm. the value of the Tomatis method in assisting the skill development of student interpreters. So nine interpreters, Receiving tomatoes treatment were compared to a control group and tested for enhancements to their interpreting performance, personality, attention, concentration, mood, and well being. Despite some limitations due to sample size and matching of the two groups, statistical analysis indicated significantly enhanced techniques and well being in the experimental group. So, in the graph, 
which was using the profile of moves, mood states. The triangles represent the pre-test scores, the square is the second test and the circle is the post-test score. So you can see that all scores have decreased by post-test, except for vigour, which of course is a positive trait and has increased. And the measures where we see a decrease were tension, anxiety, depression, dejection, anger, hostility, fatigue, inertia, confusion and bewilderment. Then we have Tinkle and Koller at the University of Vienna who undertook a study on the impact of the tomatoes training on the spatial sense in both the short and long term. They had a treatment group of 30 plus and a control group of 30. They used two sets, two tests, sorry, the three-dimensional cube test and the infinite loop test, which test the ability to visualize manipulating objects in space. The results of the 3D cube test are shown here in the table that confirmed that tomatoes therapy significantly improves spatial reasoning ability and that this is sustained for the longer term. Results of the infinite loop test were also positive in the short term, but were not sustained for the long term. Then we have Callahan at the Baker Academy of Early Childhood Centre in 2010, undertook two studies to assess the living skills on first grade and fifth grade students. The results of the testing confirm a substantial gain in the domains of communication, daily living skills and socialisation. On the average, students gain between 13 months and 34 months within these domains. For first grade students, eight students participated in a study where the C-scan test was used to assess improved auditory perception in background noise. This in turn improved listening and communication, which had a flow on effect to their self-confidence and social skills. Researchers noted, as learning has become easier for these students, their frustration level has notably decreased, which has resulted in less behavioural problems in the classroom, as is to be expected. Okay, Slaikowska in Poland studied 20 test subjects with, with confirmed dyslexia, who were compared to a control group of 20 children who did not have problems at school. All children were right-handed, had normal hearing and no vision defects. Now there's a debate about the degree to which children with dyslexia are affected by auditory processing difficulties. Tomata said all children read with their ears. The aim of this study was to evaluate time and frequency processing in children with developmental dyslexia. Auditory discrimination testing of the subjects indicated that observed difficulties in temporal and frequency sequential analysis may be responsible for problems with the segmentation of phonic sequences, which is required for effective reading skills. So this confirms the role of central auditory processing difficulties in dyslexia. There was a high degree of coherence with results of the tomatoes listing test, uh, or 80% in the test group. In addition, 80% of the test group exhibited left ear dominance as opposed to 10% in the control group. And this corroborates Tomatis' assertion that left auditory laterality is associated with auditory processing problems. Kukowski in 2000, I'll just read the slide, Tomatis postulated that left-sided hearing laterality could lead to speech and language difficulties due to the primary language centres being situated in the left hemisphere, which is more directly accessed by the right ear. They concluded that right-sided deafness is characterised by more serious linguistic difficulties, dyslexia, poor spelling and a lower standard of academic achievement, whereas left-sided deafness was associated with emotional problems, nervousness and lower performance in humanities subjects. So very interesting to see the differences um, and again corroborating Tomatis' assertions about the importance of us stimulating the right ear dominance. <coughs> Illis and Sidlauskas in 1977 found right ear lateralization with and without increased high frequency filtering was tested. And the main result observed was that increasing right ear emphasis <coughs> increased reading speed. These results support the premise that children with dyslexia do not normally make use of the right ear advantage as normal children do. So, this brings us to talking about our program that we're offering, which is called Sound Therapy Synergy. Now, Sound Therapy Synergy is our practitioner brand with added extra tools for you to use as practitioners. 
and it is available through Carol and Equipping Minds. She has it there at the conference, and some of you have already purchased your program. So I want to mention there's also an opportunity for you to offer this through your own clinic. There's a new online training program which is going to be launched in May, and that's a picture from the training there. It only costs $299 to register and undertake the training, and you are then set up in business to offer the full range of sound therapy programs to your clients. This is the, uh, this is the pack that you get when you register to become a sound therapy synergy consultant. As you can see there, it involves books, DVDs, follow-up program brochures, everything you need to get started. And it's your license to operate as a sound therapy synergy consultant as well. Now, what we recommend for your clients in using the therapy is the family program. This is, in most cases, the best program. And uh, Carol has a number of these on hand there at the conference. So if you wish, you can get this program right away and try it with your clients. It's an incredible value-added package with three listing programs on three different players, five headphones, including bone conduction. And you essentially get one program for free when you buy this package. It's the perfect option for families with more than one child and to allow the parents to listen as well, which can be an important part of the recovery process in a family. So all the tools there are there to step the parents through their listing as well as the children. To have this amount of treatment in a clinic would cost several thousand dollars. So people are quite astonished at the value offered by our program. So I've got references here and you'll be able to access all this on the Synergy website once it's launched. So thank you so much for your attention. My apologies again for miscalculating the time, but I'm happy to take questions if you, if you have time and would like to do that. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, speaking with the deafness in children in the womb. Deafness for children in the womb. So, are you still right? Come, come a little closer and explain um, that particular. So, I, I read your chapter about the importance of sound in the womb and your learning difficulties book. And my son, he was deaf. So, I was just wondering, he can hear now, but the impact that would have on learning. I don't know, it just really struck me. So, I'm sorry, are you saying that your son was born deaf? He was born with moderate to severe hearing loss. They thought he was deaf, but then he evidently outgrew it at about seven months old. Oh, fantastic. So, so are you asking the impact of, of tomatoes therapy in, on the child in the womb? if the mother listens while the baby is in the womb? Is that what you're asking about? Or are you asking no, about the impact? the impact of deafness on the womb in the first year of life, how that would impact? How that would impact his development? Now he is doing sound therapy now, so just so you know. So, I mean, so. Yeah, so, so you're wondering how his development may be impacted by the fact that he had deafness when he was first born. Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, well, when there has been any kind of interruption to the development of the auditory system in early life, there will often be difficulties with development later on because every stage is very crucial in our development. So it's wonderful that he outgrew it and that just shows the resilience of the nervous system for that to be able to happen. Uh, but there may be some, some difficulties. How old is your child now? Eight. Eight, okay. Well, how is he doing? How is his development? Is he having challenges? He has some challenges. Yeah. The academic, yeah, the academic stamina has been the difficulty. He just started his sound therapy and equipping minds about four weeks ago. So okay. He loves wearing a sound therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I think what we're seeing is, is as I said, the incredible 
ability of the nervous system to recover, that his hearing is there. And, and what I'd like to encourage you with is that using the sound therapy is going to make the best difference because it's going to help to repair any, any deficits that may have occurred from that early setback. Um, as I'm sure you know from looking at the sound therapy literature, we're aware that hearing does start to develop in the womb. So from four and a half months, the baby's already learning and taking in sound. And that continues throughout childhood and even later in life, the brain can develop and improve. So it's a continual process and all the inputs that you can give him, sound therapy, all of the remedial reading, um, remedial education, the Equipping Minds program, all of that is going to help to enhance that neural development. But I'm not sure if you have a more specific question that you're wanting me to answer. Um, please ask again if there's something more you would like me to talk about that I haven't. Okay, any other questions? Right. So the amount of time, um, we have said, you know, before start with 30 minutes, up, get up to an hour, and some students like to do it a couple hours a day. Um, adults, usually three hours a day, ideally. I mean, you can sleep with it on, yes. Is there anything yeah. too much? Is anything too much with listening to the sound therapy, Raphael? Um, well, in the early stages, we advise going uh, at a gradual rate of introduction. Now, this is particularly true for someone who has sound sensitivity. And this is why in the adults workbook, we have a listening routine assessment to fill in because for people who have tinnitus or hyperacusis, you need to go gradually at the beginning. And the same is true for children. So uh, although adults will start with three hours a day, they will start with just album one and then gradually progress. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, Raphael, I, I, you know, I had a adult the other day who, when she put on, and she has tinnitus, when she put on the adult sound therapy, literally within about 15 seconds, she had uh, pain above her left eye. Mm -hmm. And then in a few minutes, she felt dizzy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then she said, a, a little bit later, because she actually wanted to keep leaving it on. Um, and that her the pitch of the tinnitus lowered mm -hmm. and so the next morning i put the young child sound therapy on her so and it, she she did not react to it oh really interesting well, that's what i said <laughs> it might just be because it was the next morning i don't know the amazing thing you know what what is really emphasized um, when we do this work, is the incredible yeah, difference in diversity. I've never seen that happen before. Yes, yes. Look, what, what we really learn with this process is the incredible diversity between different nervous systems. Everyone is so different. And, but in general, you know, what we've done in the workbook is we've give a, given a generalization. So all adults must fill in that personal listening routine assessment so that you go gradually with introducing the programs, particularly introducing the albums, sorry, particularly albums three and four. The filtering is very strong. You have to get used to it. And this is why we say don't put it on and go to sleep with it in the first few weeks. You have to get used to the therapy first and you're gradually working up through albums one and two. With now, the with the program. With the adult program. With the adult program, and I'm talking about adults. Now, with children, some children will also be very sensitive to sound, and the parents will be aware if the child is sensitive to sound, like if they react badly to the vacuum cleaner or traffic or other loud noises, that means they've got a form of hyperacusis, auditory sensitivity. So with those children, you need to go gently, and you may just have them listen to 15 minutes initially and gradually build up. It's really a matter of observation, observing the child, 
seeing what happens, seeing what works. But the rule is build up gradually. Think of it as a gymnastic training program at the gym. You know, we're exercising muscles. And when you go to the gym, nobody would go to the gym and expect to work on the heavy weights the first day. They would start on the light weights and they'd gradually build up. And someone at the gym would develop a program for you. Now, we've got a fairly set program for adults. For children, there's so much variety. There's a lot of flexibility. And so as you read the materials and you observe your clients, you become an expert on what works. And the parents become an expert too. This is the thing with our method is that we're giving all the information into the hands of the user. That's why we have the book, Why Aren't I Learning, with every program and the family workbook. And so people can observe and see, well, if the child is finding it's painful or they're overreacting, reduce the listening, build up gradually. So it's very varied. Some children will want to listen all day or all night, and that's great. It won't do any harm if they're enjoying it and if they're not only overreacting. The only time you could do harm, and that's only temporary, if you do too much too soon for a sensitive system. So go to it at the beginning, but if they're loving it and they want to listen for hours every day and they've got used to it, absolutely no problem i can tell you i've been i've been listening throughout this presentation today i often listen all night i often listen most of the day when i'm sitting at my desk so you know on average i probably get i don't know eight ten hours in 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 a 24-hour system but then i might go without listening for a few weeks so you can't overdo it once your system has adjusted to it there's no worry about that it's simply a matter of the gradual introduction yes i hope that helps are there seizure precautions? Uh, yes, it's that's a tricky area. We have had people totally recover from seizures, totally recover from epilepsy with sound therapy. There was one instance that I've heard of in 30 years where someone had an epileptic seizure for the first time when she used sound therapy. Now, I don't know if it was related or not but it is a good idea to monitor someone who has seizures just in case, you know, we have to say that to be cautionary. But as far as we know, generally sound therapy helps to reduce seizures. So something to keep an eye on, um, not something to, to be worried about, but certainly you should always keep an eye on it. Um, what are you using I'm currently at this moment I'm using earbuds. Um, yeah, just little open earbuds. Yeah. Does it matter if it's open? Does it matter if it's open? Um, look, open is better if you're wanting to communicate. Now I have some of the ones that go in the canal, which are fine to use if you're just working on the computer, but I wanted to hear you all this morning and the open ones enable you to hear what's going on around you. So the thing with headphones is they have to be of high quality. That's why we sell Sennheiser headphones, you know, most except for some of the children's ones that they don't have those models, but all the headphones we sell are high quality. As long as they're high quality, the style doesn't matter whatever style suits and is most comfortable as long as you do the therapy. However, the big headphones, the HDA 500s, which go right over the ear, are the best quality. You will get the best results from using those. You also get directional hearing from those because they're over the whole ear. So there are some advantages to that. There are also particular advantages, of course, to using the bone conduction headphones, and that's a very important part of the system, and they are now part of the family program. Uh, but... Any headphone is good. The most important thing is just to use it. Uh, but yes, any quality headphone will deliver a result. So, uh, <coughs> uh, it's 12 dollars uh -huh, it is, Woo! yes. Awesome. Yeah, so for folks who know the cost of sound therapy, uh, yes, the family unit includes yeah, younger, older, adults, um, the bone conduction, and the books, your books, everything. 